five precautions of ultra high stock density grazing. The first thing that uh, that I, I take in consideration when people ask about about using mob grazing or, or one of the high stock density grazing uh, management approaches is one, it's not for the novice grazer or the, the novice uh, producer to grazing management. You know, it's not a management system. You know, some people that inquire, they're trying to overcome uh, uh, poor management, and it's not going to it's not going to undo the effects of poor man poor management. It in itself is just a management tool to be utilized. Again, it's not a system to fix problems. It's a tool to fix a situation. It requires infrastructure to manage livestock and to deliver electricity to to, to the fences. You know, one of the key things when you're putting all these animals into these larger groups, can you water them effectively as you move through uh, the different paddocks? It's really important. Can you can you handle the numbers in these large groups? Same thing with the pens and facilities. Do you have the right facilities in order to keep those large numbers together, even for a short period of time, so that you can uh, apply the, the management that needs to be done in a timely manner? And then if you're, using, of course, in order to uh, keep your cost down, you're going to be using electric fences, making sure that you can provide enough electricity to the extremities of the operation wherever you're going to be utilizing the ultra-high stock density. So it's not for somebody that's new to, to, to grazing management, uh, but it needs to be taken into consideration, all the things that, needs, that leads up to it. It uh, requires a high level of skill and experience in multi-paddock grazing. And one of the people that I know that are doing it and doing it successfully, they've been doing multi-paddock grazing for a number of years. You know, they, most of them 10, 15 years, and they've built into the program to where now they're, they're ready for a higher level of management. And that's exactly what it is when you get into this ultra-high uh, stock density. And we'll talk why that's important. And primarily it's because it requires dedicated labor and timely management. If you've got the animals in a small area, you've got to have somebody available to keep them moving. Even if you're using some of these bat latches that, that uh, are now available, somebody has to set up the paddocks ahead of time so that when, the, when those bat latches uh, open up the access to a new pasture, you've got uh, the pet pasture is already there and ready for the livestock to, to move into it. So it requires somebody to be able to put up the fences, keep the cattle moving, as well as doing it at the right time. You know, just be, by staying too long in an area, uh, we can actually do more damage in the short term than what we, ever, than what we really intended, which gets back to uh, we're going to have to increase some recovery time, which might not have been exactly what we uh, planned for as the desired outcome. So then number two, you know, the second precaution I have is start with a goal in mind. Too often when people uh, ask about ultra high stock density or mob grazing, you know, they really don't have a whole lot of idea why they want to do it other than they think that it may be beneficial to their, to, you know, to their range. So what I tend to recommend is if you're going to do this, you need to pre-identify the target areas where you want to get started. You know, what are the desired outcomes? You know, first, can you identify what the issue is that you want to address? And if you can, then what do you want that uh, outcome to be? And then what's the time period? You, know, you want to do it year-round? Do you want to do it during the spring, summer, or is there a, a, a more desirable time frame to get the results that you're looking for? And all that comes with having some sort of experience and, uh, uh, you know, working with this multi-paddock uh, grazing approach over a period of time and knowing your resources well. And then are you having success? You probably ought to have in, in place some sort of monitoring tools so that you can tell whether you're making progress toward your desired goals. Probably need to have plans for adverse conditions. And give you an example just last year. You know, when we had uh, days and weeks where, where we'd have uh, multiple inches of rainfall on a pasture, what happens to those pastures when you've got all these animals into these small areas? Do you have a plan when those, you know, when these situations occurs, uh, occur? Do you disperse the animals, uh, or, or do you continue on with, with, uh, with the management intensive grazing? All these things need to be thought of, and you, depending on the, the forage resource as well as the different soil types, some pastures are going to be more forgiving than others. So knowing where you're out are at any given time and what those outcomes need to be need to be taken into consideration, and of course. In my mind, you need to have an exit plan. I, as, as I said earlier, I think it's a tool, it's not a system. 
It's a, merely a grazing approach to be designed for a prescribed period of time. We don't want to don't want to focus only on the landscape or the uh, the effect the herd will have on uh, the cause of animal impact. Uh, many of the producers that, that that talk to me about trying to employ mob grazing are their primary focus is they want to improve their land resource and uh, move it from maybe an undesirable steady state to something that might be more more desirable. But in the process, they often tend to forget the the impact that uh, grazing management can make grazing management of this type can have on the animals themselves. So there's really two modes of impact as you begin to, to consider ultra high stock density grazing. And that's the you have a landscape mode and a performance mode. And, you, and as a producer you have to understand what are you trying to achieve and if you spend too much time in the landscape mode, what's that going to do to performance mode? And Vice versa, if you're primarily focused on the performance of the livestock, you may not have the same results on the landscape. So oftentimes it's, it's, it's a balance that you need to consider when you're applying your landscape mode, especially when you're trying to have heavy impact on those specific uh, uh, resources or specific paddocks uh, because you want to do it during a period of time that's not going to impact animal performance or minimally impact animal performance within a period of time. Main primary, the primary point that I want to bring out of this is it is not necessary to sacrifice animal, animal performance if you're going to uh, employ the ultra high stock density grazing. You know, the two of them can go hand in hand and uh, there are multiple producers that, that, that we work with that uh, are able to bridge that gap knowing there's a time and a place for both. The time to be in landscape mode is probably not the time when you're trying to, to get your animals bred, bred back or when you're trying to run uh, growing cattle during the growing season. So those are things to keep, to kind of keep in mind. The third precaution that I have for those considering ultra high stock density grazing is don't increase the grazing intensity. Oftentimes when we think that we're going to put all these animals together, one of the objectives would be to utilize more of the forage that's there. Actually, grazing intensity should decrease. We should only be top grazing the forages when we're in this type of, of uh, 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 grazing approach, utilizing only the top one third and then being ready to move the cattle to a fresh area. Residual matter, however, should increase with a high proportion of it being left on or near the soil. We're wanting more of that residual matter to be down near the surface, try to incorporate it to the surface because we're not only feeding our our livestock or cattle in those cases, but we're also trying to feed the microbes that are within the soil and trying to increase the organic matter at or near the surface. As a result, that's where the additional production will occur over time is just by integrating higher quality forage matter at the soil surface as opposed to running all entirely through the livestock itself. So what we're trying to do is, is to have a balance where the high quality forages are going to the livestock, uh, some of the other quality forages that may not be as, as quality as all the leaf area that would, the cattle would be grazing is actually returning to the soils themselves for the microbes and other organisms at or under the soil surface to utilize. When we're in this uh, high stock density grazing, we need to expect multiple moves per day. That's when we know we're in the ultra high stock density areas that we're moving more than once a day. And when we do this, we need to expect longer recovery periods with extensive herd effect or excessive animal impact. Again, things aren't always going to go as, as, as planned. You're going to have weather events that may impact one area that you're going to have to allow for the, uh, uh, additional rest or, or excessive recovery. And that's what we want to be able to do is plan for that and build that into your, into your recovery periods through your planning aspect. That's where the experience in multi paddock grazing really pays off is because until you have that experience of planning your grazing offense, making the adjustments and for your rest and recovery based on actual uh, events that do occur, uh, you're probably not quite prepared for uh, a higher level of management units such as the uh, high stock density grazing. And you want to plan for lengthened grazing cycles. You, it's, it's easy to put it down on paper to know that you need rest and, and, and grazing uh, sequences and allow adequate rest for the different pastures, but as we have greater impact and we're leaving more and more material on the soil surface, some of these areas are going to have some lengthened grazing cycles and we need to make sure that we have 
allocated that within our, our plan. Number four precaution is that it does require adequate forage. Now, oftentimes people that are that are wanting to go to the high stock density, they're wanting to put animals uh, at higher concentrations than what the actual stocking rate would indicate that his carrying capacity would allow. So we've got to keep in mind the livestock have to be sustained. So even if you're going to an animal uh, to a pasture that doesn't have much forage, forage for the livestock to consume has to be supplied from somewhere, even if it's from off site. Some of the uh, pictures that we've seen in, in different uh, 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 say magazines and, and, and books where it shows a pasture that, that uh, due to rest and recovery and through high stock density transformed from what looked like a desert to something that's a lot more productive and you wonder where the animals got something to, to, to eat. Well, there's two sources. If you really pry into the sources of, uh, of those pictures and you find out that the animals were actually either fed hay on those areas or they were grazing somewhere else and they were allowed to, to spend the night in these areas that, that, were, that lacked uh, any type of uh, plant cover. And as a result, you know, they were able to fertilize, defecate, uh, cause the disturbance on the soils, and with a timely rainfall, they were, they were able to get some, some forage recovery that would not have been expected otherwise. So there's ways to work the system, but it, it's understanding the, the system that you're working within to make it to, uh, to make the outcomes be what you want them to be uh, are very dependent. And that's where the experience you know, through, uh, through grazing management actually occurs. So the livestock has to be sustained, the forage has to come from somewhere. It is not an all or nothing approach. Again, it's a tool, it's not a system. What we want to be able to do is to apply this tool just as you would prescribe uh, uh, a different type of treatment. When we talk about prescribed burns and in uh, you know some of our circles, you know we don't want wildfires, but what we want is a desired outcome through a prescribed burn. It's the same thing with this type of grazing approach. It's not an all or nothing uh, approach to where it's as you would find in certain grazing systems. But what we want to do is to utilize it as a tool. When we get started, we want to set a conservative initial stocking rate based on the carrying capacity. Oftentimes, we we think well maybe we might be able to increase. Our uh, stocking rate, uh, you know, to 50 to 100 percent greater than what the carry capacity may have been, but that's not the place to start. You know, we want to start somewhere with a conservative initial stocking rate and make sure that we understand what the uh, that uh, the, the behavior of the animals. We understand the the progress, the progress that we're trying to make, and then in the long term, let the carrying capacity that that might increase over time actually drive the, the, the stocking rate and, the, and then again you know, the management thereafter. So you know, first we've got to grow the forage, then we can increase the stocking rate. And then within this, uh, within this approach, we also want to plan for a reserve. You know, not only do we want to make sure that the animals have plenty to eat, if something goes wrong, we want to make sure we do have a place to, group, to put the animals to. Uh, just in, in, in reserve. So as we get started, those are the things we want to make sure that we, we keep in mind. Also, expect a learning curve for both the grazier and the grazers. In other words, uh, both the people and the animals have to learn as you get started. And oftentimes, the, the cattle will learn faster than the producers do. You know, in the instance where, where we, I was running a ranch, the cattle always would tell, tell you know, the, the, the guys that were working for me when when it was time to move. You know, when the cattle start telling you when, when it's time to move, then you know that they they understand the system and you're probably operating about as efficiently as possible if you're responsive to the animals. Keep in mind that the best livestock performance comes with a consistent routine. So when the animals are moving, they're telling you when to move and you're moving them accordingly, you're going to get probably the best livestock performance and that's what we've seen with several of our producers is uh, they read the animals, the and as a result, they get the benefit of the livestock performance in addition to uh, the, the landscape effect. The greatest herd effect usually comes with novice cattle and, or novice livestock. And what that implies is that when you have new animals uh, put within a system like this, once they adapt to the, the grazing approach and the cattle and the movement, since they're not familiar with the resources, you get a lot more movement and, and, and uh, 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 trampling activity with these type of, you know, with, with, with novice livestock. And once an animal is, is in routine and they, they're familiar with the, 
you know, with the, uh, the property, then it becomes a little more consistent in their pecking order. You, you find that they move uh, very similar from one pasture to, to the next. That's usually the difference between having mature animals well uh, versus having a stocker type cattle. You know, the stocker cattle are going to act more more like novice cattle. You know, your cow herd, once they become familiar with the property, is uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll get into a routine and and uh, continue to follow that. Precaution number five: There's no magical stock density value or, or duration. You know, we hear about that million pounds per acre, but in, in all cases, the optimal stock density is different for every graze year. You know, we want, we want to keep in mind that uh, the greater the stock density, the greater the animal impact or, and herd effect, but not everybody needs that high, that, that, that high stock density or the animal, animal impact or herd effect. If your pastures are in really con good condition to begin with, what benefit is the, uh, is the high stock density grazing going to be? Uh, oftentimes, just being at a, at a more moderate uh, grazing intensity, where you're where you're rotating the cattle every couple of days, as opposed to multiple times a day, you're going to have the same amount of benefit and have a, a long-term uh, uh, same long-term production you would if you were trying to intensify. Again, the ultra-high stock density is really is really designed to be utilized as a tool to to improve certain areas if administered properly, not as a long-term management approach. Greater the stock density, the more frequently the moves during, during the grazing period. And what we find is within our, uh, within our own demonstrations, we'll have uh, cattle, they'll move, uh, you, know, you know, they'll be grazing for about three hours, we'll have to move them with the highest stock density for about every 20 to 30 minutes. And what we find is that they'll actually graze a little bit longer during the, the, the their, grazing events because they know that they're going to a new fresh pasture, they're, they're still eager to go just a little bit longer. As a result, when they have that, those rest periods between grazing, grazing activities during the day, they, send, they tend to be a little bit longer uh, because they tend to get uh, uh, satiated and, and stay full just to, you know, for a longer period of time. But being available, being able to move those cattle as they need to be moved, providing a high quality uh, diet to the animals or an optimal quality diet is what the objective, uh, uh, what the objective is during this using this approach. You know, what, what we try to communicate to producers that are, that are pursuing this ultra high stock density is that you want to fit this grazing to the management plan and your labor capabilities. It's got to fit your own system. It's not one of those uh, one of these management uh, uh, systems in which you try to deploy year round. It just usually doesn't fit within that, that type of aspect. You really want to prescribe ultra-high stock density grazing where the herd effect is desired, when convenient to management. And those two, are, two things have to, be, uh, have to run uh, parallel. Otherwise, you're going to end up with some sort of undesirable result that you're going to, and then you're going to uh, probably have to come back and undo and allow additional rest in order to get the recovery where it needs to be. So it's really, it's, it's, it's like prescription grazing. You know, we want to make sure that we can uh, have the impact where it's needed and we've got to make sure that, that, that it has to fit within our management plan.